Tack. Welcome to our Leading for Excellence series. Our quarterly series aims to showcase the journey of leaders related to their success, challenges, and lessons learned, in addition to delivering impactful, insight of topics that are instrumental to the business landscape. Our purpose is also focused on education through story sharing, where we solidify the human connection to the business success. Coffee and Matrix 360 believe strongly in spotlighting Black leaders and their stories. We know that stories are, our stories are really shared. We know that our stories are powerful in the ability to influence how we learn, live, work, play, and engage with our surroundings. What is not often shared is how we nav navigate these hidden objects and objectives that we have to face on the way. We are honored to spotlight our candid conversation with Canada's most vocal and established financial market leader, Ray Williams. Ray Williams is a financial service executive with more than 30 years of experience in the global capital markets. His expertise in debt capital markets, which has allowed him to have leadership roles in marketing, trading, risk averse, and execution. Drawing on his achievements with major financial institutions in London and Toronto markets in various trading, sales management, and capacities, Mr. Williams holds the position of managing director and vice chairman of the financial markets at National Bank Financial, one of the top six investment dealers in Canada. He also serves on leadership boards on various organizations, including 100 Strong Foundation, an organization focused on the challenging the narrative around young black boys and one that inspires excellence without limitation. He is also the co-founder of the Black Opportunity Fund for Canada and continues to build and create opportunities for many communities. Known as an outspoken champion of workplace diversity, Ray is the founding president and continued member of Coffee. And so as you can tell, Ray has accomplished a lot. Also, we are excited that this conversation will be moderated by one of our advisory council members and our educational partner, Chandran Fernando, a true collaborator who believes strongly in the power of diversity and equity as he founder as, sorry, my apologies, as the founder and managing partner of Matrix 360, Chandran has built an uh, advisory platform for talent of workplace strategy for the private sector for over the last two decades. The Matrix 360 brand is an extension of Chandran's core principles and drive. His mission in business is guided by his people-centric approach to build the future of a workplace where diversity is embraced and equity is the outcome. He's a huge advocate for diversity and inclusion in corporate Canada and has achieved countless awards for his work focused on eliminating systemic racism and sexism in the private sector. You can learn more about him on LinkedIn and also if you haven't, download the Matrix 360 Anti-Racism Roadmap for Everyday Action. Without further ado, please welcome Chandran Enray. Perfect. Thanks so much, Delmar. I truly appreciate uh, that introduction and your leadership um, as the president of CAUFP Coffee. Very much appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank you, Coffee um, audience, for joining us this uh, cool, cold, I think it's a cold winter evening. So thank you for wrapping up yourself in, in front of the computer to engage with, I truly believe, is a a true a true trailblazer in his, in his own right. Um, uh, managing Director and Vice Chairman of Financial Markets for National Bank, Ray Williams. So welcome, Ray Williams. Uh, thank you so much, Ray, for joining us. Um, we have about an hour or so to uh, to converse with Ray, and I'm going to ask him a couple of questions, but I really want to get the audience engaged. So, you know, if anyone has any sort of questions and curious to, to learn more about Ray or just kind of want to understand more about his journey, please feel free to 
type it in the chat box and myself or one of the CAFP team members will uh, let me know and I'll definitely uh, direct that question or questions to Ray. So as uh, Delmar mentioned, um, you know, we started this platform uh, to really hone in on the true talent of leadership, specifically around black leaders uh, from Canada. Um, and we truly believe that the power of diversity is not often shown in the Canadian marketplace. And this is why we've created this, this platform to really highlight how our leaders are really focused on excellence and success and founding real strong uh, foundation for us to rise um, to, to more of a successful society together and on a holistic uh, basis. So I want to kickstart the conversation with you, Ray. Um, you know, thank you so much again for for joining us and for really, you know, acknowledging that yes, you would love to share your story because I don't think many people have have heard the personal side of Ray. So I want to first kickstart the first question. You know, if you could, you know, share with us, you know, as a managing director and vice chair um, for financial markets, what does that actually mean, and what do you do? Like, if you could say it in layperson's terms for me, that'll be wonderful. So, you know, the, the, the title is um, as an MD and vice chair, uh, I guess I'm the first vice chair uh, within financial markets that's focused um, in capital markets. Uh, in large part, I would, I would characterize it as me being a senior relationship manager. I've been in the business an awfully long while. I've been here in Canada 30 years, um, as you've heard from some aspects of my CV and resume. I've had the opportunity to um, participate in a variety of markets. So foreign exchange, money markets, fixed income, uh, equities, commodities, and I've undertaken derivatives in pretty much all of those. I've been on the trading side, I've been on the sell side, um, and that has allowed me to develop a huge amount of contacts. And the fact that I've been in the market as long as I have, it's meant that some of those contacts end up being um, uh, I would say overly powerful from the perspective of just relationships. Uh, people I covered 20 years ago, you know, clearly have risen in the ranks as well. The nature of the dialogue is different. I'm not there mm -hmm. necessarily just selling a product. I'm selling ideas. I'm selling the culture of my organization. Um, and I am helping push what it is that we're doing as an organization from that perspective. So, you know, that's kind of very general sense of the focus that I have, it's really about senior relationship management. Let's, let's say that I fill in some of the white spaces within our organization based on the knowledge and experience I have garnered working here over the last 16 years and being part of the growth of this organization. It puts me in a particularly uh, special place to allow me to share that with our client base and uh, help some of my colleagues internally. Okay. Perfect. No, thank you. So, you know, when you were growing up, um, did you always know that the financial services market was going to be an industry for you and you wanted to oh. pursue that relationship management and dollar management for folks and companies? Like, how did, <laughs> how did you end up here? Like, share with us. It's, so for, for me, it was in large part just pure luck. But, uh, here's my reality. My reality is that uh, the driving force uh, has ended up being uh, my mother's desire to see her children uh, achieve as much as they could, okay? I did not have people around me that could provide the guidance around, oh, you should be looking at this. When I think back and I think about streaming here, we, we experienced exactly the same thing growing up in the 70s in the UK, notwithstanding the fact that you were showing through your marks that you had the ability to go one stream, uh, they clearly wanted to, oh, no, you should be doing this. It's going to be easier for you. So I didn't have any of those things. And when I say that I ended up in financial markets purely by accident, that mm -hmm. really what was exactly what it was. I just did not have um, a clear sense of what I wanted to do. What I did know was that, A, I needed an undergrad degree. Uh, B, uh, at the time I was coming out of uni, um, Thatcher years, the unemployment rate was going up in the UK. And so it's like, okay, in order to give myself a chance, I should do a postgrad as well, which I did. I did an accelerated uh, okay. master's program. And then it was like, okay, let's find a job. And yeah. in finding a job, uh, there was a position 
uh, I think it was advertised. One of the positions I, I went for was in treasury at Beach and Group PLC, a pharmaceutical company. I had no idea what the hell treasury was, but what yeah. it ended up being was something that had to do with finance. And, you know, I've undertaken economics. So, you know, not super smart, but sufficiently smart that I could learn stuff. Um, and ultimately, as I got myself ensconced within financial services, first of all, facing banks, learning foreign exchange, learning money markets, I started to see a picture. And that's how slowly I evolved into an area or into a, a business, um, a stream uh, that has kept me occupied, engaged and paid for the last yeah. 35 plus years. Yeah. Yeah, which is which is amazing, and and I remember you mentioned to me um, that you you weren't born in in Canada or in England, um, so you were born in Grenada. Is that correct? Okay, perfect. Correct. So you basically well, had, had the experience of, of 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 living the newcomer journey twice over, if you think about it. Um, share with us, like you know, like especially back then, like you know, I'm a '70s child too, so like we we we, we relate on that. Um, as in regards to like, how did you how did you navigate you know being a newcomer twice over, once you know in England and then when you migrated here to Canada to help build a platform here at National Bank. So um, the first time round, obviously, um, I say obviously. Let me share. The first time round, I moved to the UK just before I was nine years old. Um, I was brought up by my great grandmother, my great grandfather. I really don't have any clear memory um, in my early years of my mom or my dad because they left both myself and my brother fairly young. So the people that I was attuned to were my great grandparents. And so going to the UK uh, and literally being dragged out of your environment to a mm. completely different one, um, I, I, say, I would say looking back and reflecting those were some very sad times for me as a young child because mm. I came to a situation where my mother and my father had already had some other children. So I had siblings that I met when I arrived. And so it was like, uh, what's going on here? Yeah. Um, so I, I think there was, a, there was a bit of a desperation in the first couple of years um, acclimatizing. You know, you come in as this kid from Grenada with mm. an accent from the country, you're speaking, nobody really understands it. You're all in South London, isn't it? So um, you soon learn to be like the others and speak like the others. Uh, it was, some of it was definitely very painful. Okay. The second movie was one that I chose to make based on opportunities presented to me by my then employer, CIBC in London. Okay. So that was a thought out okay, I'm going to be running a team in international money markets, seven people doing arbitrage northbound, southbound. Um, and where we go, great opportunity, yeah. go for it, great. So very, very different experiences. Uh, you know, one from the perspective um, of a young child, the yeah. other from a young man uh, that felt that the universe was available to him and the world was his oyster. Yeah. So how did you get to that? Like, you know, in regards, because I want to go, I want to go a little bit deeper in regards to your philosophy on life and business, you know, so here you are um, migrating um, to Canada for business to help lead and build a, a bigger platform for CIBC, which is amazing. Um, and you, you mentioned like, you know, like basically the, the universe is there for for your taking. How did you develop that, um, that philosophy of life? And business, and the second piece to that is, you know, um, many people uh, unfortunately are still still stuck in this box way of thinking that it's always it's always about your job, your job, your job, um, and we forget about the the personal. Right, what you mentioned about having a young child when you first migrated here, and and being a young person. So if you could kind of connect that experience and how you've developed over time, um, in regards to your philosophy on life and business, and how those, um, I would say connect and are in, in, interconnected as well. Okay. Well, so I, I would say I'm, I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist. I yeah. golf, so I must be, right? It's like, you know, uh, you'd be sitting there, it's like it's raining, it's pouring, it's like, I uh, know it's gonna stop, we're gonna be able to get back out. So I, I am a, an, an optimist um, in, in all honesty. And I think that goes an awfully long way to 
even when you are knocked down, you look at, you know, what are the possibilities? How can we deal with this? Um, what do I look at in terms of how I pick myself up? And what, one, one thing I'll say from a philosophical standpoint mm -hmm. is that there are many times in this life when you will be delivered a blow. You will be um, hit in a way that you might not have anticipated or expected. Uh, quite often, there is very little you can actually do about what's occurred because it's presented literally as a fait accompli. You're done. This is, mm -hmm. this is it. But the one thing that I would say on a consistent basis you should always look at is that you still have the opportunity, the choice of how you address what you've been presented with. What's going to be mm -hmm. your reaction? You can't yeah. unbreak the egg, but you seem to yeah. still have some choices. Do I clean up the egg? What can I, what, what can I do here? Okay. Yeah. So there are choices available to you. That actually provides you with a sense of freedom up here that allows you a moment to breathe once you've got over, you know, what you feel is that immediate impact. I will, I will add to that the whole notion that we end up too often um, looking at the job that we have as a validation of self. Mm. I fully understand why it is, because if you think about it for a moment, you know, the last time we probably all gathered in a room with cocktails, there's a lot of dog sniffing that goes on. And yeah. I reference dog sniffing uh, in large part because, uh, you know, there's always going to be someone asking, so what do you do? You know, it's they want to hear, you know, am I more senior? Am I probably better paid? Whatever it might be. It's nonsense. So you need to understand who you are. You need to understand what validates you. And this is why I go back to the notion of the job is exactly that. And you should be proud of the um, acknowledgements you get about it. You should be proud of what you're doing in it to advance your career. But you need something that represents a balance and an understanding of self yeah. that says, this is my job. Okay, this is, this is what I do. Uh, I enjoy it. It gets to pay the bills. It is not the be all and end all. There are too many other things that you need to focus on for that balance that you reference. Okay. In my case, it's community. It's my yeah. cooking, my love of music, you know, my love of just reading, all of those things. I, yeah, I know a lot of people probably have no idea that I have a deep love of music, you know, yeah. and that I can throw, <laughs> throw down some good moves as well. But anyway, that's another thing. Um, but, but, but yeah, I think you really do need that, that balance and you do need that sense of stuff um, along the way to understand how to create some degrees of demarcation between what is your job, you mm -hmm. know, and what who you are. The two things, uh, they don't have to be uh, at odds with each other, but yeah. certainly I think you need to create a sense of self that says, here is what validates my existence. For me, yeah. what validates my existence is my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my children, my relationship with community, the food that I love to cook, and the interest that I have. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean to say that the job doesn't figure into it, but not in the way I think a lot of people necessarily uh, will do so. And I know there are probably people who will probably be thinking, oh, he's saying that because, you know, he's at this age, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But my reality is that along the way, there are any number of times I could have had uh, a much higher paying job or any of those things. Uh, and I made very clear choices around what I wanted and what was important and how mm -hmm. to do that. Which is, which is good because, because I know that you've had a very colorful journey, which is, which I think has really has, um, has helped pave the way for many to um, progress and, and thrive and, and learn how to find their own self zones, which I call it. Now, I know you've also worked with and challenged many status quo, uh, status quo thinkers to evolve their mindset. And you mentioned one great point, which it's, it's, it's about community. So I wanted to understand and really kind of go a little bit deeper with you in regards to the community relations side of what, what's the passion for you that fuels you to be that instigator for change? And, 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 and I want to preface something because as we all know, in the last nine months, really, the whole conversation around um, um, diversity and equity, um, black, um, 
you know, empowerment, as, as, as people like to call it, has become the real new sexy, right, in the last nine to 10 months. But we know, um, and I know that it, it's, it's, it's always been part of your DNA. Um, and that's why I, I, you know, label you as a, as a, um, as a change maker. Like you are that person who wants to instigate that real, that meaningful, purposeful change. So I want to understand, and I want the audience to also understand, you know, that, um, you know, what is that fuel that connects you to your passion to be that instigator of, of community change, specifically around progress, um, not just for the black community, but also for community as a whole. So, well, I'll, let me take it from a, obviously a very highly personal perspective. Please. Um, you know, uh, I mentioned, yes, uh, we talked about the fact that I was born in Grenada, you know, a little country kid running around, you know, uh, uh, barefoot with a cutlass in his hand, moving to the UK. Um, when I look back, what's very evident and clear to me is that I see people around me that look like me who are just really smart. Yeah. I may not necessarily be one of them. You know, I've got some common sense, but I'm talking about there's a lot of smart people that I see. And I realize that I've had um, some good luck on my side, yeah. but that luck is a representation of continued engagement and getting opportunities along the way because of continued engagement. And I recognize also that I need to help create a path for others that basically comes from a not the similar background than myself to also do and basically get to where they possibly can be, fulfilling their potential, if you will. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've been lucky, but it's not pure luck. It's also a lot of um, work where I've ended up being prepared because of the engagement yeah. I've had with people along the way and how they've supported me. So I feel that in the space that has been created for me, I too have to make space for those coming after me, those around me. And so that ends up being a bit of an imperative uh, in how I think, how I act, how I react. I mm -hmm. want to see others that are like me and even others that must not necessarily might be like me, but if they're interested and they're showing the passion, then chances are you will get me as someone supporting you, engaging with you and trying to help. Yeah, which is which I think it's very powerful um, words to share, um, and and the action that that you're actually walking, which is even which is even more powerful. Now, when it comes down to you know um, specific situations where you're running into a challenge, or if you are the only person in the room or in that conversation that people just are not getting it, you know, how do you and you know that you know from your heart and you know from your from your leadership style how do you know when to say we got to keep pushing or i got to say peace out and 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 just exit the situation like when especially when you're that one person in that room who's trying to make some progressive change and and help evolve people's mindsets how do you how do you keep well, yourself centered and focused on that well it's 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 a challenging thing for sure yeah. Okay. Um, but I, I like to go in, certainly, and I like to think about what does this represent in terms of a win all round for those that you're presenting to? How does that look? And it's not mm -hmm. always an easy thing. People are very enamored with the, with the positions that they hold on any number of things. And you have to be especially careful about how you challenge them about their thinking on a particular situation. Yeah. So you need that engagement by way of friendly conversation to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that as a starting point is of greatest importance. Then you position your points of view in a way that hopefully will get um, some traction only if they're being listened to and being given an opportunity to be heard uh, rather than slamming do the door shut on you or even on the idea. And that is, has happened in the past. Uh, yeah. The reality is that it is not everyone that 
you have the ability to um, engage them in a way that will allow them to look at stuff or look at what it is that you're saying in a fashion where they can accommodate maybe some of the thinking and, and walk away thinking, yeah, I'll give that some consideration. There are, there are just uh, clear instances where you know you say, right, okay, I got it. This person is not going to move. And I think you have to understand where you're spending your energy, uh, yeah. where you think you can really have impact. And at the end of the day, that ends up being something that by way of decision, you have to make uh, based on what it is you think you know, uh, either around a person or the facts and circumstances. Yeah. So it's not, I don't think there is a, any clear, easy path to how do you get this done. You know, it's trial and error. Um, you know, I, I've been in instances where I've literally made a decision. I'm not going to pursue a particular thing. I'm just going to mm -hmm. do my stuff. Yeah. Simply because the path I was taking in, in trying to get engagement just wasn't happening. So sorry, I'm just going to go and do it. Okay, yeah. it just might like, just do it. Um, and along the way, because you're doing it, you know, people pay attention suddenly, and it's like, oh. So it goes back to the whole, you know, black is the new black, um, yeah. which is a bit of a nonsense. But we both appreciate, and I don't doubt those listening understand yeah. where I'm coming from in this regard. You know, look, I, I will go back and tell you back uh, circa 1999, 2000, yeah. I was providing advice to the federal government, uh, the Public Service Commission, the Treasury Board Secretariat, um, uh, the, uh, I mentioned the PCO, the Commissioner for Official yeah. Language, yeah. and then a lot of the Deputy Minister community. And in large part, that had to do with like how they were going to approach and deal with the fact that the EX level within the federal public service uh, did not have anything that even vaguely represented the wider Canadian community, you know? And that was what, 20 years ago? Yeah. So this stuff is not last year's news for me. This stuff is, yeah. you know, the quiet engagement and activism over many years where, you know, I'd like to think I've shown some degree of consistency. And again, I underscore the nature of quiet activism because uh, when you have a lot of people who, you know, uh, are pushing back potentially, whether they realize it or not, because they, they're like, oh, no, hold on. What, what are you talking about? There is no such thing as racism here. Yeah. You know, we don't have anything of that nature. You have to be very wary about yeah. how that then comes across in how hard you push. Because you want some of those people to, over a period of time, to understand Correct. that there are any number of viewpoints which does not necessarily represent their perspective or their lens. Last year, of course, um, uh, I will state unequivocally that a black lens, a black lens was temporarily lent to what seems like the global population based on what took place, okay? Yeah. Suddenly, there were people in communities where there weren't any racialized uh, uh, folks still getting up and saying, we're going to change this. And so yeah. now I think the interesting challenge is how do we keep the flame burning? How do we keep the, mem the momentum going uh, to ensure that we see change over time? Yeah, and, and, and thank you for that because it's, it's, it's connected to another question which I was going to ask you in the next 10 minutes, but I'm gonna ask you now in regards to the Black Opportunity okay. Fund. You're one of the co-founders and the co um, a brainchild, as I call it, or, uh, around this. And I know it's been a, a work in progress for, for, for many years that you just recently launched it um, last uh, summer. So I wanted to, you know, and I'm, not, I'm hoping everyone on this, uh, on this conversation today uh, uh, knows what the Black Opportunity Fund is, but in case that they don't, do you mind just sharing mm. the uh, philosophy, the platform on why you, you, you and your colleagues have co-founded this and the reasons behind it um, and why this particular organization is unique in its structure? That's my bias um, in regards to why it's going to be successful. If you don't mind just sharing your knowledge around it. Sure. So what I'll say is as follows, that I've been very blessed to have uh, a good number of people that have a similar mindset to myself around the need and desire for change within our community. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the conversations have been legion. I mean, one of the reasons why we started NAUB, which is now CAUFP, which is now 27 years old, was because we needed to say, see change in Bay Street back then. We needed to create what we needed to create. And a lot of the time, you have to go out there and do it. So this is a, not a new conversation, as I've previously stated. This is an old conversation, but it had new impetus with all that took place yeah. last year. And so if ever you wanted to see how under-resourced and underserved our community was, then you saw it in droves, in shades, in any number of ways, from an economic standpoint, from a social standpoint, you saw it. Uh, health standpoint, because COVID mm -hmm. really provided a glaring light on the inequities that our community in large part um, uh, suffers from in so many different ways. Uh, you know, a classic would be $380 billion uh, that the federal government spent on COVID uh, and very little actually flowed to the black community, yeah. which was just another reflection of many of the things that we knew that our community was underserved, under-resourced. And so in large part, the thinking is as follows. We need to do something that mm -hmm. is different, that is transformational, that is aspirational, and the idea of putting together the economic and the social. The social is super important. Anyone who knows anything about the community knows and recognizes that it's those community organizations that at a grassroots level that have been there doing the work year mm -hmm. in, year out. Yeah. In many instances for decades, they have been there supporting the community. But we need the overlap and the connective tissue that represents growth in the economy and that ends up being small businesses, that ends up being entrepreneurs, okay? So you have that. Then you also have to recognize that the for the, for the idea and the notion of wealth creation, yeah. private capital has to play a part, right. okay? Yeah. They are the gateway to health. So there's a, to wealth rather, there's a, so there's a whole bunch of pieces that come together. And so where the Black Opportunity Fund is concerned, we want to uh, essentially encompass those three specific areas in terms of sourcing government, private capital, and the philanthropic world. And we want to be able to deliver an added and systematic and um, sustainable permanent situation yeah. to our community by focusing on the social. So yeah. all the community organizations out there, not for profits that don't have access, as well as our black business organizations. Mm -hmm. And that that in, in sort of like a nutshell is what the Black Opportunity Fund is about. It's a huge undertaking, uh, but there's an enormous amount of um, support that we have and that we're gaining. Um, what's very clear is that there are any number of uh, folks out there that see very clearly the need for something like this, because it's again, it's quite clear and quite evident. We've been doing the yeah. same thing over and over, and we are still in the same position. We need something new. We need something transformative. And yeah. the government is in a position to help us create that transformative change that I believe is possible. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So, I, I want to go back to you now. Um, so, for anyone who who's not aware of the Black Opportunity Fund, please Google um, Fem. Uh, the website and start donating and start spreading the word. Uh, I think that's that's a very good um, starting point for you as a community member and also you as a um, hopefully a change maker as well. Now I want to go back to you, Ray, in regards to, you know, you're involved with so many things and you have been involved with so many things, not just on, on a career side, but on, on the community side, as as I call it, you know, being the um, a a change maker. So I want to understand, um, you know, how do you how do you refuel your energy, your passions, uh, your motivations in times when you feel that you're knocked down or you feel like you're defeated or you're just like, well, I'm just like I'm going on zero. How do you refuel that energy for you to keep going? So so my balance um, actually has always been about my passions in this life. Yeah. And so. Uh, those who know me sufficiently well will tell you that my cooking, um, my barbecuing, uh, it's just one of those things where I'm especially passionate 
uh, yeah. about that. And it allows me and has allowed me over the years uh, an opportunity to go down a different rabbit hole and yeah. take my mind completely off anything. So I'll give you a classic case in point. Uh, in the midst of the financial crisis, I actually completed um, my uh, culinary arts certification at George Brown uh, by going on, only on weekends. Okay, uh, that was like what uh, I think nine courses, each course uh, essentially between eight and 12 weeks. But over a period of three years on a part time basis, I was able to do that. And that created enormous balance for me and yeah. continues to, to this day. When, when, when I'm feeling crazed or I've had a day that, you know, has been especially challenging, there's yeah. nothing better than going home, getting a couple of knives out, seeing what's in the fridge and seeing what I can create. Because the minute time I start chopping and peeling, you know, your mind then becomes focused on that. And there is a certain joy and a certain beauty. I, uh, I've always stated that cooking is my personal meditation. It yeah. allows me that escape from the other thing. The other things will always be there. Uh, they're not, they're not going to go away. I'll have to come back yeah. to them. But you, if you want to talk about how I refuel, I refuel both body and mind through through my cooking. Mm. So I guess uh, when we're able to socially gather again, there'll be a barbecue at your place then. I, 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 I'm, that's, what, that's what I'm hearing. I'm, I'm feeling that. There's, there's I'm hearing barbecues that. that. There's barbecues everywhere. Look, each year there we I, go. I cook in a, in a big barbecue fest um, yeah. called the Big Green Egg Fest or the Toronto Egg Fest. Um, you know, I cook at home, obviously. Uh, I've been told unequivocally I'm not allowed to have any more barbecues because I've got four <laughs> now. But, uh, you know, I don't see what's wrong with more barbecues personally, but yeah. I also have to uh, understand I need to pay attention with my wife's speaks. <laughs> True, true. That's true. So, you know, um, as uh, Delmar mentioned earlier, like I, I'm really focused on building the future of the workplace, um, but to, but doing it today. Like I, and I believe that you are in that sort of similar mindset. So when it comes down to, you know, young leaders and we see a, we, we see a huge wave of young, young people, you know, taking the frontline stance of really helping with the change that uh, the progressive change that we require. Um, and, and as you know, the, uh, at CAFP, um, you you know, there's a lot of young leadership on this team who's actually pushing the wave. What you what you have found, so I wanted to understand, and, and you know, if you could give one word of advice to this generation of leaders uh, and moving to the next generation of leaders that's coming behind them, what would what would that one piece of advice be when it comes to understanding what success looks like? How do you continue uh, moving forward, and what success means like to you? Um, as a whole, how would you sort of um, advise our, our current generation of leaders? Well, wow, that's uh, that's a bit scary. Um, so, so one of the things I'd say uh, is that you need to have um, either a mix of sponsorship and mentors. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, sometimes uh, you just need to have around you people that you trust sufficiently that can challenge you where you're willing to listen and hear from them. Mm. I've been very blessed um, when I think back to when we first started the organization, all I seem to have around me were people who challenged me. So, you know, I'll, I'll put it out there, Stanley Julian, who's a total pain, uh, you know, Earl Davis, Del Kamanga, Koran Chisik, there's a whole bunch of them that, um, you know, even to this day, we have seriously engaged, uh, a seriously engaged relationship. And that engaged relationship uh, is an honest one that if you have a situation you need to deal with, this is part of my peer group. This is part of my group that will steer me right. Because mm -hmm. if I put something in front of them, they will come back and say, yeah, you know yeah. what, that looks great. That's rubbish. Right? And because yeah. of the trust, what I've built with them over time, it ends up being super helpful. So I have, like, I have this uh, impromptu board of directors around me that I can turn to. So I would say to the young leaders, find the people within your circle, find a mentor or mentors, find a couple of people that you can have honest, open relation uh, conversations with 
that allow you to put in an honest way, uh, here's what you're thinking, and have it either taken apart or shown how it could uh, maybe be modified to actually achieve what it is that you mm-hmm. None of us do this uh, by ourselves. All of us need support in some fashion or the other. And so yeah. it's important to build that circle of trust, that circle of people that you can go to with regularity. Hundred percent, and and that's that's those are great uh, words of advice. So I, I want to also understand this because, as you know, being in the position that you're in um, and a leader that you are on the community and also on the business side, um, sometimes there's a lot of noise around what you do, how you do things, and you as a person. Um, so what do you think is the is the greatest or the biggest misconception about you that people have? Uh, <laughs> You know that 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 they they may perceive. <laughs> what would you what would you say? Uh, um, oh gosh. So let me start by saying, if you know me, you know, you know, um, that sounds kind of obvious. Uh, but I, I gave up a long, long time ago trying to impress upon anyone what it is that they can they should be thinking about. Mm-hmm. People will uh, look to compartmentalize you, people will look to put you in a particular space for their own purposes. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, do what you need to do. Um, My reality is that uh, some people might see me as overly serious, other people, especially the ones who know me a little bit better, probably think, uh, you know, I I focus too much on jokes and when I say jokes, just being jovial. Yeah. you know, I've even been told that if I don't smile enough, I look intimidating. Uh, you know, maybe, but uh, in large part, like I'd like to think that I'm a, a very approachable uh, uh, individual. So, you know, I would say uh, ultimately that some of what people might believe about me, they will find that, you know, if you actually take the opportunity to have the conversation, mm. you might be surprised about what it is that you find. Yeah. So I don't. I, I really, honestly, do not worry uh, yeah, about but others, those yeah. misconceptions. Yeah, I'm not here to sort of like have it be that I'm the most popular guy in the room. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I am who I am. Um, I think uh, the, the nature of who I am is that I'm a person that I believe has a lot of integrity and veracity. Um, you know, I can be quite tenacious. I can be a lot of things because at the end of the day, you know, you don't see just one single, no one, no one single one of us no, has only it, a, a one singular yeah. part to yeah. Yeah. quite, quite, you know, uh, and it all depends on facts and circumstances because who you might see on a Saturday morning as I go shopping will not be the person you see on a Monday morning when I'm in a, yeah. in a serious meeting of clients. hundred percent, hundred percent. So we've, we're getting some great questions here, but I want to connect one question to one of the questions, um, uh, what Jacob Janke um, said. So, you know, you've mentioned this and, and I know this growing up in Canadian society, you know, what we see now when it comes to diversity, it's not what it was 25 years ago, 30 years ago when we started our career path. So I want to understand, you know, what are some of those challenges that you have witnessed over the course of your tenure as a leader that challenge your diversity, you, you know, as a man, as a black man, as a father, and as a um, newcomer? Wow. Well, I, I, you know, so let me go back about a year ago. Um, where are we? February. That's correct. About a year ago this time. I was in Vegas for something called the Structured Finance Association Conference. There's probably like 7,500 people in attendance. Uh, They say when you have a conference that large, it's a reverse indicator of what's about to come. And boy, did did they get that right. Uh, There's a gentleman called W. Carmel Bell. Uh, Those of you who watch CNN may have seen something called the United Shades of America. Mm-hmm. W. Kama Bell is, is a very big, tall black man, a big afro, short yep. pepper beard. He's got to be at least six, five, six, six. So I stood up next to him and I was like, good God, he's a big person. But he's a comedian, he's a CNN presenter. He's on stage and he's talking about a whole number of things as it speaks to being, uh, uh, being black. 
And he basically shared that, look, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a CNN presenter, I'm a bon vivant, I'm a bunch of different things. But you know what? When I walk the streets or go anywhere, people look at me and all they see is a black man mm. my black skin. And that, that hit me so hard. I'm like, it really gave me food for thought. Stuff that you know, you know, because my reality is, yeah, you know, here I am a black man working at National yep. Bank, been in the business for X number of years, you know, husband, father, brother, mentor. But the reality is that when you step out into the open, that's who you are. You know, you're yep. that black man in your black skin. And that's how you approach a lot of the time. So you have to understand the nature of that, but still strive proud, still walk in the fashion yeah. that basically says, you know, you know, this this is how I roll. This is who I am. Yeah. So let I want to explore that more. And Jacob Janke um, asked, I think, a very good question that connects to this. Um, and I'd like to um, share share it with you. Um, mm -hmm. so he said, you know, um, hearing, you know, as, you know, he hearing you as a black actress, I'm using that very loosely, um, in the workplace, you know, um, how, how were you able to navigate and solidify yourself in your career, especially, you know, 20 plus years ago, 30 years ago, it was a different landscape, right? But here you are still being community uh, engaged, you know, trying to help, um, break down some challenges and barriers that were very um, uh, deliberate, right? For people of color, especially black um, black people in, in the corporate world. How, how were you able to, um, how were you able to really hold, you know, hone in on that and understand that and manage, manage how to um, navigate those environments without having your diversity become self, um, the center where it's going to sabotage your success. How were you able to manage that? that yeah. Transition? So look, that so that's that's a, that is a challenge that balance because I think if you are a black person uh, in the professional workplace, uh, a lot of the time you may not want to respond in the way that you really want to respond based on a stupid comment being made to you because you don't want to be. Um, seen as being either overly angry you don't want to be seen as well he's not very approachable all the sort of uh, language we know that can be used to discount uh us as black people within mm -hmm. the workplace so you really have to thread the needle in large part um i would say one of the things about me is that i've always been a fairly confident uh, individual to the yeah. point of profit, i would say uh mm -hmm. that has not always served me well um, I yeah. you know, class point when I came here in 1990, running my department at uh, CIBC, you yeah. know, uh, I ran it so well and we um, made so much money that when they were merging departments, I naturally assumed that I would be the one getting the job rather than the person who did get the job. And I would have to say that uh, that was probably one of my first clear signs that some of the stuff I've left in the UK were very present here in Canadian society, yeah. right? But also it was a reflection of, like I said, the confidence that I had, mm. because that confidence came across in a way that would piss people off, if the truth be told. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was less about them looking and saying, you know, that Ray Williams guy and his team of seven over there in IMM, they're doing a great job. Look at the PL, look how happy his staff happens to be, right? Rather than, that guy over there is, is a little bit too cocky because they did not necessarily understand or appreciate me as a black man working yeah. in that environment. So there's no, there's no easy way about this. You have to make personal calls on a continual basis about how you balance who you are as this individual that is culturally different from everything that you're seeing around you. And those mm -hmm. calls come almost on a daily basis. Over time, you learn to actually work your way through, uh, you know, this sort of crowded ugly situation because you're doing it so regularly. You actually uh, learn a lot of approaches on how to manage that situation. Mm -hmm. 
there is there is no clear path for any of us. Yeah, that there's no clear formula to to navigate it. No. And, but uh, and another question which which popped up with uh, Camila um, Papadopoul. Sorry if I mispronounced that because I know I did, and I do apologize for that. Um, she was speaking in regards to like you know how do you how do you how do you create that balance when you know internally and externally sometimes that that could be conflicting, right? And especially when, you know, when you recognize that opportunities have been have been pushed out of your way because of the scheme that you're in, right? Or because mm -hmm. you are that young person or because of you're a newcomer. Um, how do you, and then, you know, internally, you got, you got to take that in and you got, you got to like learn not to personalize that, but also use that as fuel. So how do you create that balance that you're able to keep your focus on, on where you want, where you need to go, focus on the passion of being that business leader that you are now, and then also that community leader. How do you create that? You know, because and, and I know that there's no set formula like you could just pull up an encyclopedia and say, or Google it and say, boom, right? So, what are your what what kind of suggestions would you would you advise um, our audience today about that? So, for me, uh, you know, obviously I can only speak, you know, from my particular perspective. It has been sense of self. Yeah. Right? It has been my sense of self work. My sense mm. of self. My sense of self says, you know, I've worked as hard as anybody else. I've got the undergrad and the postgrad, you know. Yeah. There aren't that many people that are necessarily so much better than me that I cannot compete with the best of them. So I think you have to have a sense of who am I? Mm -hmm. right? You know, and despite what might be coming across uh, in terms of people wanting to tell you something different or trying to discount your capability or your brilliance you have to be really in in line with your sense of self who are you like you know uh for me i'm especially proud of myself as a black man and i step yeah. out there each day uh in that black skin and it is what it is you know yeah. um like I said, you you just really your sense of self and self worth uh, ends up being, to my mind at least, anyway, a very very big um, driver of yeah. how you want to do stuff. So so another great question. I'm going to summarize it from Niha Kovac, and you know she she mentioned in regards to like you know when you're up for an opportunity um, for advancement in your career, and you see. And this happens, and I'm in talent management. I always see it that someone who is of uh, of of a white skin generally will get that promotion. Who's less qualified? Um, so, how do you like keep yourself focused on your self worth and know how to navigate that without becoming jaded and without becoming, you know, disenfranchised with the potential what you're bringing to the table? So, I mean, that's that's a really tough one. I think yeah. um, earlier in my career, uh, I certainly uh, found that substantially more challenging. Uh, today, it would be easier based on just the experience I've garnered over time. One of the things I would always look to do is sit down and work out the reasons why you should be receiving what you believe to be appropriate for you, i.e. there's a promotion. Uh, you have to necessarily be the person that presents here all the reasons why I should get that. Yeah. And if you don't, then try and understand exactly why it was. Now, was it driven by um, the person you presented to uh, turning around and challenging what you said you achieved versus what you felt you achieved? Or was it just simply because of the particular bias that quite often occurs? Well, you don't quite know. Mm -hmm as though you'd have typed yeah. for this or you, and there's still so much of that out there. That's just a reality. Now, you know, there's always the opportunity to say, you know what, time to get the hell out of here. Yeah. Right. Because when the culture within the organization is not speaking to you, you need to find another spot. You need to find yeah. somewhere else. And I know yeah. that ends up being quite challenging. But I've spoken to so many people over time where they felt it was almost easier to stay within a rut because they know the rut. Yeah. Rather than the fear of the new. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's 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 true for all of us, right? Like we all fear the unknown. And every time you 
leave a position where yeah. you know your stuff and move to either another firm or something else within your organization, there's a certain amount of fear because the fear of failure, will I be able to do it? So it comes back to, again, having the people around you that can support you, right? That gives you the kind of mental space or mental support that allows you to say, you know what, you're right. I do think I'm as good as you say I am. Yeah. Some, you know, sometimes it's a simple stuff that you need to hear from people around you, around what they really think about you. Mm. And that's why it's so important to have, like I said, you know, that informal board of directors that are your friends, um, you know, as well as, you know, people who are your sponsors or people who are your mentors. Yeah, 100%. And, and I think that that's very, very key. And I think that's the core of it all. It's like, and I love how you framed it. It's like having your own board of directors. It's like considering yourself as that that business entity. And as a result, you should have counsel who, you know, who could be open, who could guide you, especially in the times when you when you know that you should have gotten that opportunity, but unfortunately it wasn't there for yours to take. Then you have a, you have a system to go back and you could sort of um, share your emotional and mental um, challenges there so that they could, they, could, they could leverage you up. And you also said something great as well in regards to mentorship and relationship building. And, and there was a, a great question, I think, from Bilal. Um, and he said, you know, Ray, you mentioned a lot of opportunities from the connections you made, it, made in um, the financial industry. How would you say you capitalize on these relationships and connections? And specifically, how were you able to leverage your networks while still maintaining while still maintaining organic relationships? So one of the things I will say, and I've said it many times, I mean, over the years, I've done a number of networking sessions for CAUFD, UFSC um, with younger folks. Uh, and one of the things that becomes quite evident is that for whatever reason within our community, one of the most powerful resources available that comes essentially free, there seems to be a lack of desire to take up, mm -hmm. which is networking. Okay. Um, networking is important because the engagement of people from different aspects of society, yeah. from uh, different industries, uh, another reason why you should do a hell of a lot away from just your regular job, because that's when you really meet people. And I think you have to show without doubt that you have an interest in those people. But yeah. You have to understand that you need to be able to maintain many of those relationships. Because at the end of the day, those are the relationships quite often, as you've maintained, as you've engaged, are the ones you can turn to for honest advice. Because yeah. my my observation over time is that if you make a small, discreet ask, nine times out of 10, uh, if someone is in the position to deliver it to you, they will do so. Mm -hmm. So I think learn and understand what it's like to create a network, you know, at all levels, uh, within all aspects of your industry and other industries. You never know where it might lead. Uh, the other thing about it that's beautiful is that um, you have the opportunity to learn so much from people. And it doesn't necessarily mean someone more experienced than you. I mean, I've learned way, way too much from my own kids, from my own kid. But uh, it's just about how you how you choose to listen. Are yeah. you, listening with intent uh, goes an awfully long way to getting you really very informed. 100%, 100%. So there's another great question that popped up and it, it's, it connects to this, this entire conversation, which I think I would like to pose it to you. Um, and um, it comes from D D Denise Hall and I love this question. So thank you, Denise, for answering, uh, asking this. Um, it's, it's in regards to this new catchphrase that has been, you know, um, a lot of folks have been chatting about. It's like bringing your whole self to work. Um, is this really possible for, for black professionals? like to bring their whole self to work, especially if you're in that non-management level position or even that mid-level mid, mid management position? How do you bring your whole self to work and can you? So what I will say is that um, I do believe it's possible. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a long way off from being uh, 
the most the most standard situation. But I'm very much aware, for instance, if you were to look at um, certain organizations where they literally support very clearly different communities, whether it be LGBT, uh, uh, racialized minorities, whatever it might be. And you, what you have is clarity from senior management that this is important to us from a cultural standpoint. And when I say cultural standpoint, I'm not talking about people's specific culture. I'm talking about the culture of the organization. Yeah. Right? That can go an awfully long way to bring in, you know, and I don't really fully sort of grasp the whole self, but I think I understand what is being meant by it. So do I bring my whole self to work? I bring as much of myself to work as I, as I choose to show yeah. and share, right? Because it's not, I don't necessarily want uh, folks to know every single aspect of who I am, but I can certainly bring enough and show enough. And if you're a younger person, again, you know, you need to be wary. Make sure you understand your environment. Make sure you understand who it is that you're dealing with and, yeah. you know, um, uh, approach it accordingly. But what's very evident is that, again, in large part based on some of what happened last year, there seems mm. to be a greater desire on the part of companies to appreciate and understand that when you have diversity uh, from a variety of perspectives, culturally, you know, um, uh, so racially, um, you know, uh, so, yeah. geographically, yeah. Uh, yeah. sexual orientation, yeah. you name it, you have the opportunity to actually get, hopefully, um, uh, more impactful outcomes because you're giving people uh, a degree of comfort about expressing themselves with, with perspectives that may not come from that same sort of group fake situation. I still do believe uh, in direct response to Denise's question that we're still some way away from, uh, from that situation. But what I do like, however, is the fact that there are some organizations out there now uh, establishing some very clear, measurable objectives about what they would like to see. And throughout all of this stuff, let me tell you, if you don't have leadership that is um, showing with some degree of clarity that there is belief there yeah. and that that tone from the top uh, is not coming through, you're not going to yeah. have anything. But if you can get that tone from the top, then, yeah. you know, I, I keep I have I have the funny phrase around, you know, whatever uh, in, interest my boss fascinates the hell out of me. Well, you can take that and then throw in some KPIs about how it would impact uh, your assessment as a senior manager, uh, then it goes an awfully long way to creating the environment where the possibility of whole self at work is there. That's, yeah. that's where I see it from, at least anyway. I hope that uh, reflects. Um, no, I think I think I think you've answered it quite quite well um, and with a lot of great detail. Because, and I truly agree with you. You you, you can't general you can't bring your entire self to work. However, you could select what are those key attributes and competencies that you want to showcase and your experiences. And then how does that connect? But I guess in regards to the whole cultural element, you know, um, a lot of times there, what you mentioned, there is a set culture there that needs to actually evolve. And that's where yeah. we have to continue, you know, pushing the boundaries so that there is the true value of the power of diversity being being uh, owned. Um, another good, great question. I love this question. I, I probably don't have to ask answer any any more questions here. But another good question, which which came in came in line, is um, you know, again around the power of diversity and the concept around and the conversation around diversity. Um, um, it was coming from Linda Ganda, and she she asked you, Ray, um, you know, how do you pivot the concept of cohesion that co that 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 consists in the current status quo? Um, because all too often the culture is made of, of an excuse of conformity. So what I'm what I'm understanding what she's trying to ask here is that, you know, how can we um, help evolve workplace culture or even societal cult cultures um, so that we're moving away from the status quo default way of thinking and mindset of thinking and continue pushing without um, falling victim to the excuses of, of, you know, that's just the way it is. We're going to get there. Just keep working hard. Like without all that 
hokey stuff that people have been well, constantly telling us. Like, how have you been doing it? Because so, you you've done it on a on a which, and I love what you said. It was you you do it on a more of a very um, implicit, very quiet way of doing it, but you're very firm and you've helped move a lot of stuff forward. So how so can you continue we still that? Have to go, we, we, yeah, so we still have to go back to the kind of commitment you're going to get from senior management about yeah. what they believe is important. And so, you know, last year, again, you know, a lot of firms made a lot of statements. Uh, I think what's going to be important uh, is as we move ahead to do a check and see who made a statement mm. and what's been achieved or what's uh, been done. And yeah. look, there's a lot of work now out there that's making it very clear that in any number of areas that the notion of inclusion in particular, because I think, I think diversity, uh, the diversity pieces at this point, when, when I say overdone, it's like, too much of a tick box exercise. Yeah. What you want is the piece that represents inclusion. Yeah. Inclusion is where you actually are participating, where you have thought about, you know, um, I heard a great uh, comment this afternoon about not just being at the table, but being one of the legs of the, uh, one of the legs of the table. And I thought that was quite, quite interesting in terms of what it conveyed and what it meant that you are so integral to the process. So we need to see more of that. We need to see more of that in all honesty uh, for us to move the dialogue and the conversation ahead. Look, part of the reality right now is that you're not gonna change the continued um, uh, growth of racialized communities here in Canada. That's increasing, especially with the immigration policy that we have. It's newcomers who is uh, who will be supporting and continue to support uh, mm -hmm. the housing market where, you know, people are getting, uh, you know, even greater wealth. So you're going to see change. Mm -hmm. You need to understand how do you utilize that to the benefit of the Canadian to Canada at large, okay? And that's, again, for us to go back to the BOF, you know, yeah. you look at the, the, the racial wealth gap, think about what that would look like if we're able to create greater economic wealth within the black community and lift you know that situation in yeah. terms of the dollar spend available think about what the impact is for the canadian economy not just for the black community but for, yeah. for the economy with large for the economy yeah it, 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 it yeah it, it makes there's a lot of sense to be had out of the situation you just have to get around some of the blinders and i'm yeah. hopeful that as more institutions realize and appreciate that there is an opportunity for real change, real beneficial change all around, uh, you know, maybe we'll see more of that. That is certainly my hope and that's what I continue to push for. Yeah, no, 100%, 100%. So I wanna I wanna kinda mellow, mellow the conversation a bit and then I wanna get into the serious <laughs> stuff again. Um, so Cindy Govea, um, uh, she she knows you. She has a she has a she has a question for you. She said, uh, "You're an amazing chef. So, what's your favorite food to cook, and what's your favorite fast food, if you have any?" Um, and also, um, she says, "You know, the food and the music pairing is very perfect." So, I wanted to share that with you as well. So, do you have any favorite fast foods or any favorite food that you like to cook? Favorite fast food. That's interesting. Like, do I cook fast food? Um, yeah, it's like most dishes I, you know, I mean, like I can, I can whip up a dish in half an hour or less from start to finish, uh, you know, uh, a rice dish, uh, would be very, very simple. Um, pasta dishes are really super simple. Uh, but if you wanted something really, really quick, actually something I did the other day was that I pan fried a nice piece of salmon, crispy skin, um, and at the same time, I stir fry a mix of veg and just literally better veg stir fry with a beautiful piece of salmon, uh, you know, and just a little bit of butter sauce on it. And that was that. Yeah. And that was that was uh, probably about 15 minutes, right, in terms of a yeah. really quick dish. In terms of the dishes that I love the most, so I, I love to travel. Travel is one of the things I really do miss the most. The last time I traveled was 
this time last year, I've gone to Jamaica with a friend uh, who has got a place down there for a week, came back and mm -hmm. went to Vegas. And then that yeah. week down there, it was just great because we just traveled everywhere, eating this and eating that. And, you know, uh, for me, uh, back in the islands, you know, so the fruits and everything else was fantastic. Uh, but uh, I, I have and love fruits from all over the globe. Um, I have a particular love of uh, Korean food, um, love Japanese food. Um, I love fruit. Uh, I think in terms of favorite dishes, I, I would actually say that lamb ends up being my favorite protein and raka lamb being one of my absolute favorite things. Right? And nice. it is a dish that I think is substantially easier to cook than a lot of people believe. Yeah. Um, as with everything else, it's just here are the three steps that you should use, you know, yeah. in terms of the sear, in the oven, the rest, and then before you cut. And, it, it, you know, it, it really is a fairly simple process, but it always looks so elegant on the plate that uh, it's just one of those things I love. Yeah. I, like, while I eat all different proteins, it is one of my favorite proteins. My wife is more of a fish lover, so, yeah. you know, uh, I do like to cook seafood. Uh, Sunday, I cooked a beautiful paella uh, for, for the two of us, uh, you know, and I think that that's probably about 45 minutes start to finish. Really, really simple dish to cook, but it's beautiful, it's elegant. Like I said, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. So it's, it's interesting to watch you speak. Um, so when we're chatting about um, your career, you were, you know, you were, you were, I can see you back into it and you're, you're, you're kind of like sharing. And then we start talking about, you know, diversity and the, the push of, of, of changing and evolving our systems. You were very, you know, really forward thinking in regards to, you know, very um, formal with, with what you shared, what you were sharing. And now when we talked about your, one of your passions, this, this other personality came out. It was like this, like this, like you just got into it. That's kind of cool. And, and I think that in itself connects back to bringing your whole self, you know, and selecting how you, how you navigate that and how you push it. So I want to go back to another question, which is really um, focused on, you know, there's, there's, and you, you, you touched this, there's, you know, our Canadian government has, as we know, has increased the numbers for newcomers every year. So about between 450,000 to 500,000 newcomers. And most of these newcomers are coming from non-European countries, which I think is a great thing because most of these people also are coming who are very highly educated, um, who have those right. degrees, who have that experience, right? But when they come into Canada, we hear that conversation is like, you don't have enough Canadian experience to, um, to start or start at the bottom, like way in the bottom and then like work your way to the top. So, you know, and, and most of these newcomers, unfortunately don't have the network or connections to make something happen even better for them. Right. So they're really in a sense of, 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 a of, of, a, of, of a loss, it's not a loss, but it's just a, of individuals who are still trying to navigate the path for success. So two questions here. The first question I want to ask you is, you know, what advice would you share with people who are at that crossroads, you know, on their path and, and, and that path seems a little bit clouded or distracted or um, gray because there's so much noise around them. Um, how do you, how, how would, how would you advise them and, and guide them in regards to that? You know, whether it's a newcomer, whether it's a person in their mid-level career or just, or just kickstarting their career. So um, I think it, it would be maybe a little bit different based on uh, the sort of three situations you mentioned. Let me speak to one where I think um, I might have some, some insight. Uh, and this is sort of the whole notion of mid-career uh, person. Uh, we go back to the, the whole notion of, well, what is it that you actually want to do, number one? Yeah. Number two, do you have the appropriate skills to do it? Uh, number three, what do the people around you that know you best, who are best able to say, yeah, you definitely can do this. What have they said? Mm. Okay. It's really important, you know, because if you have trusted advisors, if you have people around you that you have a huge amount of faith in, those people I think will provide really honest uh, direction for you. Yeah. Um, with regards to someone that's really just coming in right now, that's substantially more challenging. The federal government actually just needs to do a better job uh, yeah. from the rather parochial, paternalistic 
approach that they've been adopting for so many years. Um, you know, they, they need to change that up and recognize that there's a reason why you're bringing folks in that are essentially economic immigrants. They're yeah. coming in with a huge um, amount of assets, uh, economically as, as well as intellectually. And yeah. that's stuff that we need here in Canada, right? Uh, so why is it that you're choking it? You should be providing even more uh, resources to ensure the shortest, smoothest, um, you know, acceptance into mm. society. Because again, net, net, that ends up being a plus to the Canadian economy, for God's sakes. Yeah? Now, a lot of people will probably write in and say, but that means that housing prices will go up even further. <laughs> Which is mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, which is true. And, and, and I want to ask another question connected to this in regards to mentorship. So it comes from Kaosin, and she wanted to understand, you know, um, you know, how did, how can you, you know, if you're at your early stage in your career and being a newcomer on top of that, um, how can you make that connection and develop those um, relationships so you, you, you're able to create that board of directors for yourself and then also what advice would you provide to someone early in their career on how to how to seek out uh, and find those mentors or find those board of trades uh, sorry board of directors for them so part of the reality is that um, it's going to differ based on who you are uh, i go back to the whole notion of like the the necessity and the importance of networking. So that's that's one piece of it. How do you find them? Well, you know, it depends on your field. Uh, I suspect that for many of the members of CAUFP, they're in some kind of um, uh, track that represents finance, real estate, uh, financial services more generally. Okay, so there is an opportunity to seek out organizations that uh, that operates in the particular area that you have an interest in. And if that's the case, then, you know, join something like a CUFP, yeah. for instance. This is where you get the opportunity to engage with peers. This is where you get the, uh, the opportunity for exposure. And this is where you start building out, you know, that, that network that we talk about. This is, you know, especially as a newcomer. So that's that would be my takeaway. That would be my my thoughts. Okay, perfect, perfect. I know we're we're close to wrapping up here. I just have two more questions for you, and this is about the future outlook for yourself. You know, um, so question to you is, um, so what course of action would you recommend other leaders uh, who are interested in creating more inclusive spaces um, in their companies or in society? Um, how they could how how they can govern and manage better in, in regards to um, building better and doing better and acting better? What would you recommend? Well, look, um, I, I, I was reading a report the other day from, uh, I think it was Deloitte. It was called uh, Black in Canada. Mm. And I, it's available out there. So it's people should take a look at it. Uh, it's a pretty good report. It's quite deep in a lot of respects. Um, it talks about aspects of uh, Canadian history here in terms of Africa, Africa and uh, a number of other things. But my, my takeaway was something that, that they have called OED. And it, the lead uh, represents um, listen, uh, listen, engage, mm -hmm. listen, engage, acknowledge, and do. That's it. It's, it's been a long day. Yeah. Um, and what I found really enticing uh, about this was that I remember last year, Dave Mackay at RBC mm -hmm. turning around and making a statement about his lack of appreciation, him and his senior staff, that lack of appreciation of how their black employees mm -hmm. have been impacted or how they felt in so many areas. And so they did a listening tour. Yeah. Forget about forget about anything else. Don't don't be speaking anything. Go and listen. This is what we did at the Black Opportunity Fund, by the way. Right? Even though we thought we knew what some of the issues our community might be facing, yeah. we decided 
let's not be creating solutions before we actually understand the situation. Exactly. So I would, I would encourage, you know, that LEAD aspect, listen, engage your black community, <laughs> people, your, the ERGs, the black ERGs, um, you know, in that listing, acknowledge what it is that you're hearing, right? Then look to how you might undertake creating change, because it is my honest opinion that if you're able to do that, what you will have, what you'll create is a culture for your employees mm. where your employees will want to stick around. And if you are able to do that, that is long time success. Uh, yeah. That is creating, uh, you know, a culture within your organization that speaks to where people want to be. That's that's kind of my big way. That would be my, my suggestion. My hundred percent no thank you for sharing that ray i actually you know at matrix because we're specializing in workplace strategy and talent management i've created a formula similar to what what you what you mentioned with deloitte i call it the chandy formula and basically what that is it's very similar but it's really about the pause so it's about pausing reflecting unlearning getting uncomfortable uh, or, or becoming uncomfortable in regards to understanding what's actually happening so that you could relearn in order to take action so then you could repeat uh, repeat that entire cycle again because part of what what i what i've been experiencing and and hearing what you what you what you've been sharing over the last hour way is that you know there's a lot of systemic um um areas that have been ingrained into the system good things and bad things um and it's like how do we you know and for us to remove and evolve those bad things and the not so good things is to really be able to you know pause and listen so that we're able to move forward together so one last probably two last questions and then what we could call it a, a night but i'm sure we could go out go all night here but the last question is i want to ask you is you know when you think about the future you know and from where you were 30 plus years to now and the great progress that you've seen happen um what what do you think about the future? What what excites you the most? And what goals and projects are you looking forward to um, as you as you continue leading the way? Well, look, um, in the 30 years I've been here in Canada, uh, there has been the, the needle has moved. OK, let's let's just be uh, yeah. understanding that it, it has not moved as much as I'd like to see it move. Yeah. Uh, you know, the idea that you have one of the most senior black uh, uh, individuals in the capital markets or in, in the markets here in yeah. industry as Del Comanga, the global head of all trade products, I think speaks volumes. OK, uh, you know, you've got people like uh, Karunchi Sekiotu, um, you know, as chief strategy officer. You've got just there's a whole bunch of things that we did not see 30 years ago. The challenge now is to ensure that those young folks within organizations like CAUFP end up in that appropriate stream that will create additional great leaders along the yeah. way. So that's important. In terms of topics, right now, the two things that uh, end up being top of mind for me is uh, standing up the Black Opportunity Fund in a way that would represent permanence and sustainability as part of our DNA. Mm -hmm. And seeing organizations like 100 Strong, for our black boys, always my where my thing very proudly, uh, seeing that organization expand away from just the GTA right across the country. So that's uh, yeah. that's more that's more than sufficient. That's more than yes. sufficient. I would tell 100%. you. If you have five more minutes, I want to because I've because time ran out, and I want to really talk about the uh, 100 Strong um, in regards yeah. to the entire foundation of it why you started it, where, what exactly is it, and then how can we as a community and other communities support the movement of it? So, well, 100 Strong uh, and our website, 100strong.ca, is an organization that we set up uh, about nine years ago for young black boys. Uh, there was a report that came out maybe in 2010 uh, that referenced that within the GTA, something like 38.8, almost 40% of black boys were not complete in high school. Mm -hmm. And that was just horrific. I mean, you know, when I think about that, it's just horrific. That, that should not be. So 
Donald McLeod and uh, Ainsworth Morgan took leadership. Ainsworth is a principal, Donald uh, is Justice McLeod. And they brought a number of black men together. And we decided that we were going to be the change that we wanted to see. Mm. And so we have created something called a Strong Academy, where we take a number of black boys between uh, grades six and eight each year yeah. in a three-week summer academy. And that summer academy um, ends up creating such change in that short period of time that it just blows me out of the water. Each year when we undertake our graduation, I will tell you I'm almost in tears and I'm not an overly emotional person from that perspective. But when you see these scrawny, skinny little boys there, you know, reciting uh, to each other a pledge, and it really is a focus around excellence without excuses. We are trying to ensure that we are creating black men that will be engaged in society, that will be leaders in society, and we're starting to see that slowly but surely. So it is something that is a, 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 an absolute huge passion for all of those that are involved, our sustainers, our different supporters, our key stakeholders. And it is something that we want to see grow. And it has grown over the last eight, nine years. It's been a labor of love and continues to be. But now we're getting substantially more support. So we'll see where it takes us. But uh, I can only hope that with the continued support of an amazing board and the various sustainable uh, stakeholders that you know, we'll achieve quite some things. Yeah, which is amazing, which is amazing. And, you know, um, I'm sure we could spend another five more hours just chatting and, and picking your brain and, 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 and learning from your intelligence and your experience. So, but unfortunately we are out of town. I want to be mindful of, of your time and um, truly want to thank you, Ray, for sharing your insights, your perspective, your experiences, because I'm sure many folks who are on this call and who will be listening to this after the fact will be inspired to, to do better, to act better, and to get involved. Um, one thing which I want to really, you know, thank the audience as well um, for for participating, for asking your questions, for for listening actively. And two two main key takeaways I would like to share, or three main takeaways I'd like to share with you is, you know, uh, Google uh, Black Opportunity Fund if you don't know uh, the, the platform and you want to learn more, get involved, share it with your communities, and also, you know, not just the Black community, but other communities, because uh, I think that's very important. Second piece is, you know, if you're not a member of CAUFP, definitely uh, become a member. There's many folks on this call right now who you could connect with or just go to their website. Um, because as Ray mentioned, it's about learning how to navigate this field of the corporate Canada world that we're all living in uh, and building your networks. Um, also in regards to creating that board of directors that Ray mentioned, I think that's very key. And I think, you know, moving forward is, is if you could take two pieces of, of, of real concrete examples is learn how your internal strength uh, what is that is and how do you navigate that and second piece is like how do you build that board of directors for you as a business um so i will also, also want to thank caufp for allowing matrix to help co-lead this event um please do check us out, uh, us out as well we're here for you uh, we're, we're all about community development as well um, and being mindful in regards to doing better and acting better and building better together. Um, so I'm going to throw it back to Delmar. Thank you again for uh, for this great platform for us having the opportunity to share together. It's over to you, Delmar. Absolutely. And thank you both. And thank you both for this great conversation. We really appreciate you guys coming out, giving your insight, Ray. The amount of insight that knowledge that you've dropped tonight is just incredible. Um, we actually had one more question. I hope that Ray, you can quickly answer that we got uh, <laughs> online. Cause here at CUFP, we truly believe in call for action and things that we can actually take away from these great conversations. So the question that came in for Ray and Shannon, please be your insight as well is what type of things can we or should we be doing as a community to ensure that the next generation doesn't have to go through the obstacles that you had to go through, Ray? So I, I would I would say let's try and ensure that we create the support structures that would allow for smoother transition. By that I'm referencing, you know, 
how do we ensure that those with experience from our community who are in the position to provide mentorship undertake that? You know, how do we call upon them? Uh, there are many people, and I'm not calling out anyone, but there are many people that I know I've seen in Bay Street uh, doing quite well from our community, but who do not necessarily um, get engaged in the same way. Uh, you look, everyone um, should do what they feel comfortable doing. I'm not going to sit here and create judgment. But what I will say is that when you find people within our community, within the professional spaces that you want to see our young people in, we should be calling upon them to provide uh, some guidance. We should be calling upon them to provide some degree of mentorship. We should be calling upon them more generally speaking to see how they can help, how they can support. So that is one way, I believe. Uh, and again, when you look at the change in environment that we're finding ourselves in, it strikes me that uh, more organizations are looking to, uh, uh, to participate in that way. I mean, Derek, uh, uh, Derek Raphael from Icon Talent Partners. I mean, you know, that's one one direction. Uh, the folks at the Onyx Initiative, uh, that's another. You know, so there is stuff out there that I think um, has the opportunity to help create that stream, uh, you know, that path and that support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 if I could add two two seconds of that too, I would say, you know, it's challenge challenge with, with purpose and challenge you know knowing know that you know when you approach anything it should always be with a sense of care so that when you do leave the space that we're all you know in that the next generations that are coming up and who are beside us will be in a better place so i think it's really going back to what ray said is building better networks it's uh it's connecting it's having these types of dialogues with purpose and it's making sure that you're consistent with your messaging um, and don't get stuck with the noise because there's always going to be noise around you. Just keep your focus and build that board of directors so that you could push forward um, and support each other. Right. I think that's a key thing. And um, which part which we never talked about, unfortunately, because of time. But it's really to understand the power of women as well, you know, of women leadership and connecting it back to the holistic yeah. way. Because Absolutely. as we know, um, women are the backbone and the front bone of many communities. And I think it's it's about time, because I'm a true advocate and champion for, for gender equity, and I believe Ray as well, is like learning how do we actually navigate that together um, in a more system-like uh, process. Um, so I hope that uh, that answers, um, and I, I could have added that too. So I'll leave it back to you, Delmar, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you both for that insight. It was just, it was a question that I thought we had to get answered just because of your expertise from both of you for sure. So um, I want to take this time to thank both of you for having this conversation with us. I'd like to thank the audience for attending tonight. We had a great turnout. So thank you so much. Um, if you guys haven't, please go check out Matrix 360 Anti-Racism Roadmap for Everyday Action. It is a must read, make sure you read this. Um, and what we kind of hinted at uh, throughout this conversation and Ray was mentioning with CFP is, CFP before the pandemic was known for our networking and how we were integrated within the community. So we are definitely bringing that back. So t keep an eye out for our Slack group that will be coming shortly. Um, and after uh, starting in March, what we're going to be doing after all of our speaker series events, we're actually going to be hosting virtual networking as a way that we as a community can start connecting back together. So looking forward to doing that. And if you guys haven't already, please follow uh, Matrix360 on all of the social platforms, follow Coffee as well, and make sure that you connect with Ray. Ray, Cindy gave out your IG, so people will be starting to follow you on Instagram. So beware of that. There may be some people Whoa. sliding in the DMs to get some tips on uh, how to cook. So uh, we can follow you there. But is there anywhere else that we can follow you uh, on social media to get in contact with you, Ray? So I've actually got uh, two Instagram accounts. One is uh, one that focuses more so on the piece that's shall we say, more professional stroke community, which is Ray Ma Wills. Um, and then the other one is, is all about food. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, well, we we got that tag, so wait, wait, look out for the follows for sure. <laughs> okay. So Head thank you both for this amazing conversation, uh, th and thank you to the audience for being here. We hope that you have a great night, and please stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a good night. Thank you very, you very much. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Have a nice one. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Ray. Thank Absolute pleasure. Perfect.